Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. So I lead a lab at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory that is focused on the control of robots and spacecraft. Um, I've spent the, most of my past 18 years at NASA helping to explore Mars. But today I'm going to be talking about world building and art and how art has intertwined with some of the greatest human exploration expeditions in history. Now, I think a lot of the people here this morning would very much like the world to recognize games as a proper form of art. After all, the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences has arts right there in the middle of its name. And if I were to ask why, I think some of you might say, well, Jeff, games can be achingly beautiful like this. They can tell enthralling stories like that. They can make us laugh, maybe even occasionally make us cry. However, if you'd like games to be recognized as a great form of art, I'm afraid that some of you, not all of you, are going to need to step it up just a little bit. See, great art doesn't just move us as individuals. It can move entire societies. Great artists have inspired riot and revolution. This great artist inspired the greatest act of human exploration in history. Chesley Bonestell, an artist who studied art and began his career in architecture, producing beautiful visualizations of buildings like this one, 1930, of a building in New York. These were glimpses of the future, but just the very immediate future, showing people what their city would look like if this building were built, helping to motivate the investment and the approval of those buildings. But Chesley was drawn to the romance and the storytelling of Hollywood, and that brought him to the West Coast, where he painted matte paintings or, or set backdrops for some of the most celebrated Hollywood films, like Citizen Kane and, and others. Chesley's other great love, however, was space and space exploration. And he found a way to blend those two passions of art and exploration for the first time in this painting for Life magazine, which many of you may have seen before. And if you haven't seen this particular painting before, you've seen pictures that look like this before. And you probably, when you look at it, you might get a feeling like it's a bit cliche by some modern standards. And let me assure you that when Chesley first painted this, it was by no means cliche. This was the birth of space art. Everything you've seen that looks like this really can be traced back to Chesley and some of, of his colleagues producing these kinds of paintings. This is Saturn as viewed from Titan. It was the first of many paintings that he would produce and each of them he approached with equal parts of artistry and science. Carefully researching every detail, this is Saturn from Mimas, every detail by consulting the best astronomers of his time, pushing right up to the limits of our scientific knowledge, and when that failed, making the most educated guesses that he could. To the, 19, to the people of the 1940s, it looked almost as if photographers had been sent into space. Many great scientists and explorers trace their moment of, of inspiration to Chesley Bonestell's paintings. Carl Sagan said, I didn't even know what other worlds looked like until I saw his work. He also directed some of his talents to science fiction. He produced covers for science fiction magazines like this. Many science fiction authors counted Bonestell among their greatest inspiration. But his work reached its heights when he was introduced to Werner von Braun, NASA rocketeer, key leader within the Apollo program, or what would become the Apollo program. Werner von Braun was trying desperately to sell the idea of a human expedition to the moon. He'd written many articles about this subject, but his words finally came to life with the illustrations of Chesley Bonestell in a series of articles produced for Collier's. This is not a magazine that exists today. In fact, it's not really clear that there's a magazine that exists today that's really like this. But I want to emphasize, this was not a science magazine. This was not a magazine for science fiction nerds. This was an, 
a magazine for everyday Americans, read by the average American. And in simple, plain English, brought to life by beautiful illustrations produced by Chesley Bonestell, Werner von Braun laid out the specific ways that we could accomplish a human expedition to the moon and beyond. If you take a look at Bonestell's work here, it's fantastic, it's exciting, it feels um, marvelous in its depiction of these events, but it also, and perhaps most importantly, felt plausible. It felt within reach. It felt like something that we could do and should do, something that was almost our birthright, a time that, something whose time had come. Interestingly, von Braun and von Estelle did not stop by just depicting the next step of going to the moon, but the steps beyond that, an exploration to Mars. This illustration shows all of the components that would need to be assembled in Earth orbit before mounting the expedition to Mars, and everything that would arrive there on Mars based on the best science of the time to achieve the Exploration Act on Mars. That act of not just thinking about what was coming with the next step before us, but the leap beyond that, I think made those immediate next steps feel all the more plausible and all the more reasonable because they were motivated by this longer range vision, one step along a far greater journey. Bonasso took us all the way down to the surface of these worlds with these, what might feel somewhat fanciful by these, by even today's standards, depictions of how a colony might appear on Mars. Now, at the same time that Bonestell was producing these amazing illustrations, many other things were being drawn, many other works of fiction were being made, and by the way, 1950, we need to have a serious talk about gender roles in uh, your films. <laughs> I'm not trying to say that these works weren't important or that they weren't enjoyable but they served a very different purpose. It's the difference between two dudes in space helmets, one of them is a space wizard in a galaxy far away, the other one is just trying to grow potatoes. <laughs> it's the difference between explaining away every inconvenient challenge, any problematic plot point with magical powers and, and technology so advanced that it feels like magic. It's instead choosing to live within just enough of those rules that you leave your audience feeling not only thrilled and excited or scared or delighted, but also with the impression that this was something that could happen, perhaps even in their lifetimes or in their children's lifetimes. And so, I love that the game industry produces works that are packed with aliens and ray guns, and I'm gonna keep buying them and keep playing them but there's also an enormous opportunity awaiting those who might choose to fill this great void in the industry today. To tell stories with this amazingly powerful medium that aspire to something a little more than delighting and entertaining, but to inspire as well. This brings me to the core question of this presentation and of the project that we're gonna share with you, which is what would Chesley Bonestell's work be today if produced using the amazing, almost magical medium that you all work with every day? But rather just ask that question. I reached out to the Academy and to some folks like Randy Pitchford and was very fortunate to find a studio willing to volunteer their time to explore that very question, to just dip our toes into the idea of using this medium to create an exciting and plausible vision for the future of human exploration on Mars. And I'm so excited to unveil our results today. Please join me in welcoming Rob Cunningham and Aaron Cambeets from Blackbird Interactive to the stage to share Project Eagle. Yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Aaron. Good to be here, man. Thank you. Um, it's a deep honor and pleasure to be here. Thank you to Mike and the Academy for having us and um, to Jeff for doing this collaboration. And to follow Jeffrey's fantastic talk is uh, deeply humbling, so let me just get that out of the way right away. Um, 
on behalf of everyone at Blackbird, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, we're excited to show you Project Eagle. Um, we initially hooked up with uh, Jeff, and our plan was to make a base on Mars using the Deserts of Karak game engine. Um, so we immediately started being game designers and started doing game design. We started with some small habitation modules, shuttles, things that uh, might populate the world. And we carried along in this way for a little way, while, but it started to dawn on us that maybe this wasn't quite Chesley Bonestell sized. Um, so we decided to try and take a bigger bite out of the future. There we go, that looks a bit more like a Chesley sized thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll admit, the first time I saw this, I, I, I was a little concerned. <laughs> I said, a little how, further future than you had expected. How big is that dome, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We can't out-influence Chesley Bonestell, but we can out-dome him, maybe. We can out-dome him. We can out-dome him. Uh, um, we started designing a city around the dome. And uh, you can see in the next few slides some of the urban planning designs we, just, we did. I want to point out... Uh, Things like sulfur piles and perchlorate piles, these are things that came out of our phone talks with uh, JPL about the plausibility. Um, the soil in Mars is full of perchlorate, that's kind of bad stuff. But it's full of sulfur too, which is great because you can make concrete of it. And I'll also, you'll also note that there's uh, lots of solar panels. We thought, well, you know, our Mars colony is gonna be sort of a sustainable green colony. So what did, uh, what did Jeff say? Yeah, I nah. said honestly. I'll bury a couple of nuclear reactors. <laughs> That's what we do, so yeah, that's what we do. Yeah, a fission reactor instead. One thing I'll point out, by the way, is that um, the terrain that you see and you're going to see underneath this, this is all real data. Uh, we gave uh, Blackbird orbital data and surface data of, of a region on Mars called Gale Crater, which you're gonna see in just a second. And uh, we also gave them all of the reference material we could about our current plans for human expeditions to Mars. And throughout the concept art and through the experience itself, you see the DNA of the exploration architecture that NASA has come up with, but evolved and extrapolated to a point 100 years in the future. So here's some more base layout designs. You can see the dome complex taking shape, some access roads around the terrain, and in the top left there, the launch facility, where you have to brainstorm what kind of launch facility uh, would accommodate a base like this, and a lot of it would, of course, be underground. Here's it's a nice little warm night. place to live in the cold, dark yeah. Martian night, of course. And we also started doing some vehicles and started populating some scenes. You know, we love vehicles at Blackbird, of course. That's one of the things we do. Here you can see the Curiosity rover and a more Martian movie-like lab rover. Um, and then we thought, okay, well, if we're gonna go mega dome world, there's gonna, there are gonna be vehicles at this base that are way bigger and cooler and more utility-driven than a, than a lab rover. So, we came up with these uh, vehicles here. You can see the yellow utility trucks, very similar to the Deserts of Karak vehicles, of course, uh, and then the big red earth mover. I'll mention that that lab rover uh, is very similar to the current design for our multi-mission space exploration vehicle. So there's a lot of, a lot of DNA in that one. Mm -hmm. All of these back and forth design sessions took place with Jeff over, over Skype um, almost daily. And, you know, it never got old saying we just got off the phone with NASA. We, we, dropped, <laughs> we dropped that one a lot. Yeah. Um, here you can see a concept sketch of two utility vehicles moving away from the dome. Um, it was pretty exciting to see these come together in a way where it felt like the human presence was uh, well established, but not yet routine, I think was the way Jeff put it. So after planning and thinking and dreaming and imagining, um, we went ahead and we made it. So let's go to the live demo now. So again, as Jeff pointed out a second ago, uh, what you're about to see is a 3D representation of Gale Crater. Um, Jeff and his team at JPL provided the radar data for the topography and the geography, the, the model, um, and of course the satellite images to recreate this location in, in, a, in an accurate and authentic way. Here's Gale Crater. You can see the little roads emanating away from the base as the camera drops in, and here we are at Eagle Base. Welcome to Eagle Base. It's a small, uh, semi-permanent or permanent colony on Mars. Uh, as you can see from the overlay, it's slightly centralized, but it also has some outbuildings and lots of structures spread out over the desert. It's not just a, a big dome with people, but it's a, hopefully a thriving little community. Now, if you look out into the desert to the north, is it to the northwest? Just to the north, yeah. Over out there. in the lonely desert, you'll see a plinth. 
a monument, and that monument marks the spot where 105 years ago, Mars Curiosity touched down, because as of today, this is the year 2117, and there are 5,592 people living in Eagle Base. Unless and anyone's been born. Uh, no, I don't think anyone, the population count is right up here in the left, is, I don't think that has changed. Um, Jeff, perhaps you can tell us where Curiosity is now. It's somewhere over in these, these dunes or mountains? Yeah, the base is set at a place called the Mary Buttes, and uh, Curiosity today is heading up kind of in the direction of what's called Sagan Observatory uh, on, their, uh, on their map. Uh, towards those those little foothills of Mount Sharp, which is the five and a half kilometer mountain that you see right there. We also have the what we call the census manager map. So here you can see the Mount Sharp data, uh, topography data. Curiosity would be somewhere up here in this road area. And I love this view because uh, everything in the base, if you click on it, it pops up descriptions of them explaining, for example, how the colony produces oxygen and food, uh, where launch and landing takes place, what's inside that giant dome. Um, I love also that you can see the subsurface structure there. Maybe you guys can talk more about that. Yeah, uh, so the colony produces air, water, and food in a number of ways, but m some centralization and some decentralization. You'll notice the dome in the center is where many of the people live, but it's also the colony's biggest reservoir of breathable air and uh, clean water. But you can see outside of the dome, if you want to zoom in, Rob, on the, there we go. There's auxiliary living quarters and also algae ponds, things like communications towers. Now these living quarters are of course uh, partly buried to shield the residents from radiation, but they're built around a light well so that people have daylight. I think people need daylight. So looking at the underground, underground view, you can see the main well is a little bit deep there. So this is one of the times we consulted with Jeff and his team at JPL to find out how deep you would put a well to get to a liquid aquifer on Mars. Uh, and just to be clear on that, we don't exactly know, but uh, we do believe a couple hundred meters down, uh, there's a good chance that a colony like this could find a source of liquid water. We've just got to discover evidence for water on Mars about 300 more times before we know, right? There you go. <laughs> So now I'm just playing around. Uh, one of the cool things was working with Unity 5.6 Alpha was it's got this cool lighting timeline. So you can just set up four lighting scenarios and just kind of toggle between them where it kind of scrubs time lapse style to the next lighting setup. So here we can see sunrise about to take place. You see the Martian sunrise is kind of going, I think, at super speed here as the sun breaks across the mountain. Then we go full day, take it over tonight, and you can see. Rob, can we catch the uh, sunset? Yep, I think it's coming up right here. Sunset there you go. blue. Yeah, blue sunsets on Mars. On Earth, we have red sunsets, and the sky looks blue. Um, but on Mars, the sunsets are blue, and the sky looks a little red. So we also wanted to build a colony that looked like it had a little bit of history. The dome is the most recent, it's the biggest structure. But along that sort of central boulevard, you can see uh, outbuildings, and then here at the end, this is the oldie town. This is the, probably the first place that a colony was established. It's the classical sort of pods and habs and things. And behind it, you can see the original landing field, but way behind that, out in the desert, you can see the new launch facility. Rob, why don't we go there? We're gonna zoom in and check that out. So the elliptical landing area here was, uh, we originally we had a big long landing strip like the shuttle would use, but Jeff and his team advised that the atmosphere on Mars is so thin, you wouldn't really get a lot of uh, lift on a, on, a, on a winged body landing, like on a run, runway. So we like the lifting body shape. As you can see, here's our little, our little launch vehicle sitting in its underground facility waiting to launch. And um, the idea was that it would come in and land vertically sort of SpaceX style, land on that elliptical area, then be relocated, taxi along, and then go down to the underground works here where you can see it gets serviced, refueled, and gets sent back up into space. So we can trigger that movie. So I hope you can tell we had a lot of fun thinking, planning, and imagining. This is the world's biggest sandbox. Copy, clear to launch, thank you. to go back home to uh, sunny Las Vegas. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>
Yeah, I want to thank Rob and Aaron so much. It's been just a privilege to work with, with Blackbird on, on this project. And uh, one really awesome thing oh, is, is that uh, Project Eagle is here uh, at DICE. So in the arcade, we have it set up, and you guys can play with it, poke around and find all the secret little things that have been hidden throughout that base. And I hope you can see in Blackbird's work the spirit of what Chesley Bonestell produced in his time. And I'm hoping that it could inspire even one of you to do something else in this vein, to, to reach out to uh, the consumers that might be very excited by this kind of a vision, this kind of an experience. I'll also be challenging NASA to find new ways to engage with people like you to help tell these kinds of stories. There's a whole universe, I believe, of journeys to write um, an experience out there, and I'm looking forward to what you create. Thank you very much for your attention.